Shalom and welcome again to another exciting edition of the Torah Watchman Show, LLC. Your humble host here, Reb Yar bin Emet. I hope everyone's been well. First of all, my primary listening audiences are the beautiful Karate people. We're, we're a minority, but we are not a minority according to Jehovah, our God, right? My brother, my sisters, I love you with all my heart and soul. You are my adopted external family, maybe. You have not decided to adopt me yet, but no, I'm coming. I'm coming to Ashdod, Israel. I'm planning on moving my family there and retiring there very soon. And of course, B'nai Noach, I'm in love with you too. Why? Because, you know, there are going to be two types of groups in the time of the Mashiach and the founding of the Third Temple when... Um, Eliyahu blows his shofar blast and brings everyone home to Jerusalem. There will be observant Jew, the Jewish people, and there will be B'nai Noach. Regardless, these two groups of people will be true monotheistic groups of people that will forever and ever worship only one true God in Eretz Israel, which is actually... You know, the center of the universe, you think about it. We have a parasha, Rhea, and Rhea essentially means to see or to perceive, to discern. Um, you could say it's uh, like a prophet seeing into the future, perhaps. You can read uh, this key word in Davarim, Davarim chapter 11, verse 26. The entire uh, parasha Sidra, however, covers chapter 11, verses 20, 26 through chapter 16, verse 117. I'm going to first give you a brief synopsis. Now, the last, the last parish that we had, and I mentioned this before, this is the last will and testament, testimony of, of uh, Moshe. Yes, his, he knew his, his days are coming short. He wanted to spend the last six, six weeks, essentially, of his life um, uh, preaching to the Jewish people, Admonish them, encourage them, strengthen them, especially to the young people have not, that have not yet formed their mind or hearts uh, completely yet. You know, the, the Jewish people made so many mistakes on the way, and unfortunately many people died in the journey, just like Baal Teshuvah Judaism, you know me, you know, born, uh, born of uh, ethnic Jewish parents, but born without or, or Torah. That's not necessarily too bad, you know, it really isn't. But anyway, everyone, everyone's life as a Jew is a journey. Even your life as, as, a, um, as, a, as someone who is considering Jewish conversion, that's a journey as well. And then B'nai Noach, well, you weren't sons and daughters of, of the laws of Noach forever, right? You came from various other groups of religious beliefs, philosophical worldviews as well. And now the Jewish people are packing their bags. Yes, they have all their suitcases. They're going on a vacation a lifetime. They're getting ready to cross that River Jordan and go finally go into the land of milk and honey, the promised land, the land ruled by giants. Yes, 
many, uh, probably a dozen different or more Kananite kings there. And talking about the Hittites, Pre uh, Prezrites, and many other uh, nation states there. We were just waiting for the Jewish people to come there and to engage them in warfare. Of course, this was something that, that uh, Moshe made abundantly clear. All you need to worry about is to obey my, uh, the holy commandments of God. I went to Mount Sinai twice for you to reiterate this truth that they are is a crossroads in life, a blessings of, of, of blessings of following God's word, and then curses, and exactly what Rhea is talking about, looking um, past the horizon of your life, in retrospect, hindsight is twenty twenty. do you really want to go back to Egypt? Do you really want to go back to where you came, or do you want to go forward in a better path? Okay? Highlights of this parashat is the uh, tale of two mountains, yeah, Mount uh, Gerizim and Mount Ebal. Uh, Gerizim was the mountain established for pronouncing blessings. And uh, unfortunately, Mount Ebal was the mountain designated. And this is immediately on the other side of the, of the River Jordan uh, for curses, Mount Ebal. And uh, immediately after they passed through the land, they would set up and, st and stage the Levite priests would go to each mountaintop with the, ten, with, a, with the writings of the Ten Commandments, the holy misfits are placed on rocks in a makeshift altar of, of, of rocks that were not sculptured, but natural rocks. We'll get to that in a moment. Also, the uh, divine presence uh, will, will be guaranteed to dwell always with the nation of Israel. Even though we don't invite the divine presence, we don't, we don't invite Elohim in every aspect of our lives, unfortunately. I mean, that's why we've, we've been exiled from Israel. That's why Jerusalem has been invaded about 16 times, destroyed twice, and, why we have, and we have two destroyed temples behind our belt, too. You know, unfortunately, there's consequences for disobeying God's word when you have the knowledge when you've been educated about the truth. And this is what Moshe, he could see the future of the Jewish people, he could see them in Babylonia, he could see uh, Assyria, and Persia, even the Roman Empire, he could see uh, far in the future, he could also see hope with the Mashiach in the, in the days to come, in the world to come. Also a brief synopsis here is prohibitions of tattoos. I don't know how many of you have tattoos, I was born with natural tattoos called birthmarks. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, the first Aliyah, again, Moshe informs the Israelites that they, that they can be recipients of your blessings or curses. You heard about a crossroad, right? And sometimes when you're driving out in rural areas in a country, and the, say there's a sign that was blown, blown away by the wind or maybe a car accident or something like that, and you're not sure where to go, and maybe if it's cloudy, you're not sure where the sun is, especially if it's night, and you don't have the uh, lit full moon there, and it's cloudy, you don't know where to go. And sometimes you have to flip a coin, you know, heads or tails, which path to go. This is endemic of the human condition, it really is. Which path will lead to blessings? Which path will lead to curses? And it's all about allowing you know, Jehovah to, to lead us. You hear about the game as we played the kids, follow the leader, right? What, you know, again, I joked about this last parasha. My Tati, my king, my holy God wants to be the leader of my life. But I have to hold his hand. I have to walk where he takes me, even though it may be scary sometimes because we cannot see our understanding is finite compared to his uh, infinite understanding of the multiversal concept of the cosmos, right? So immediately upon uh, passing uh, through the land, of course, Meshach would not be going with the children of Israel. He had already uh, given uh, his uh, ceremonial robes um, he already uh, has exchanged his staff to Joshua. Joshua would be leading the 12 tribes of Israel across the River Jordan. 
And as soon as they get across, you know, people get excited. And when, when the, and the and the imminent death of Mashiach looming, people forget. Without Mashiach there, you know, you you kind of your mind drifts a little bit, and you say we're leaderless. You know, Mashiach was was there. I mean, he was like a helicopter parrot. He really was. He was very loving, very kind, very patient, full of grace and mercy. The same attributes and virtues that we love, um, Jehovah, you know, so much and truly. Because he's the anchor holds, right? But you know, Mashiach could not be there forever. You know, so many rabbis passed away during COVID, for instance. Many people we loved and trusted, uh, leaders of yeshivas, leaders of synagogues throughout the world, that passed away. And you know, unfortunately, when these leaders pass away, we realize then we put way too much faith and trust in human beings, right? A quick uh, example. My wife and I built a house uh, in Charleston, South Carolina, soon after we got married. And this was about eight or nine years ago. We're getting close to our wedding anniversary. And we built a house to contain the entire Muspoka, about 30 people. Um, my wife's family came from Soviet Union and as war refugees around 1992, 1994, and so on. Anyway, we set up a house, we bought a house, very large, uh, dining room for Passat because in during Passat, many whether you are religious you or not, you generally come to that family gathering. You really do, and you come there and you and you have the Passat, your seder meal. Then you have a have a feast and you have a, a get together. You tell stories and things like that. But you know, unfortunately, after my wife's grandparents passed away, the people started drifting away. And when we read in Hebrew, um, you know the uh, the, uh, the, about the Seder and about the stories in Egypt and about the plagues and everything else, people want the short version and they want it shorter every year. As this way we are, right? Because when we lose those tangible things we consider reality, our mind drifts. And we start thinking about, you know, maybe I need to lead my life. But, you know, whether we perceive of Jehovah in our life on a daily basis, whether we drop to our knees and our face uh, to the floor and, and allow, say, we are undone, I need your help, whether we plead with, with God for help or not, he's there, he's there, he's there. He may be hidden from us, um, you know, unlike the way he used to, was on Mount Sinai, the way he was to the Jewish people and all the miracles. You know, God gave us plenty of miracles, you know, the Jewish people. But we we saw those miracles, we forgot about those miracles, and then we strayed. We strayed. And the God sent thousands of prophets to warn us. And reiterating some of the things in his parashat, Rhea, uh, that I'm about to, about to uh, get really deep in, warning us to stay away from the other nations that do not believe in Jehovah as an absolute truth, and his, and his holy Torah. So you can read um, about the details of, of Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal, the way these uh, mounts would be assembled uh, on, on each respective mountain, and Deuteronomy chapter 27, verses 11 through um, 16. This is actually Ki Tavo, and that's coming up very soon. Moshe uh, commands the Israelites to destroy all the idols in the land. Don't hide anything. No, no uh, images were allowed of anything. Uh, and most of, of observant homes of, of Jews, we don't have any statues. We don't have a lot of paintings either. We're forbidden to have a graven image, especially in places of worship like our synagogues, which is our equivalent temple these days. So we have to be very careful with that. In fact, when we uh, buy things uh, at a retail market, if we don't get it directly from Israel, uh, this is problematic because we don't know what hands had touched that. If they hated the Jewish people, if they were evil people or not, the labels, the decals have to be removed and has to be dipped in the mikvah for blessing so it can be the law of modification take effect so you can own it and then consecrate it as kosher. So... Um, 
the idols were a temptation. Um, they were like good luck charms. Some people believed that they could go on that blessed road, the, the, uh, the nirvana of their life, if they had this idol or this rabbit's foot. You know, I remember in the South, you know, people would put a horseshoe, you know, high up above the door of the barn, you know, these kind of things, superstitious things. And people are very much like that. We like to hold on to tangible objects. We like to, to hold on to people. And we, we are very cleany in that. And we don't cleave to Jehovah, our Tati, our King, like we should, like a child should with their Abba Father, right? So the nations were, were going to be a seductive lure to the Jewish people. Moshe already saw that in the future. He saw that the, the, um, the road of good intentions did not lead where Jewish people thought it would lead them. He warned them. Fortunately, his warnings and admon admon admonitions, his admonishments, his examples that he provided, essentially going back in the past, are talking about uh, how, what the Jewish people experienced, why they had to leave Egypt and everything else. The young people, did, some of them did uh, pay attention. Or when I be speaking to you today, they, if there wasn't a remnant there, I mean, there wouldn't be Jewish people today. We would just be merged, and uh, as the diaspora, it, we already are fragmented as it is. The nine and a half tribes are lost throughout the nations, and many people don't even know they're Jewish. They really don't. Well, um, again, um, Elohim informs the nation that in the future that Jehovah would designate a specific place in Jerusalem where he will choose to rest his presence. Think about the seventh day of rest. Think about where, where uh, um, our Lord of God is comfortable and wants to dwell and be centered in his center point upon the earth. I mean, I mean, just think about this. The king of the universe could choose any mountaintop to settle his throne, like Mount Sinai, Mount, Mount Horeb, right? But Mount Moriah, and it, will, it doesn't go into detail in this parashat about that, but, you know, this is a place at Abraham, you know, the binding of Yisak, that was where the same place was, you know. And uh, this place was the only place allowed for temple worship and, and, and sacrificial offerings, with a single exception of the red heifer that must be outside the tabernacle of Mishkan, the Holy Holies, outside of those areas, in a remote area outside the camp where that, that specific type of sacrifice would be done. The second Aliyah, um, it is forbidden to offer sacrifices in any other place, and unfortunately, in the time of the judges, later on after uh, Yosef passed away, people would try to sacrifice in, in, uh, in places like Shiloh. Um, there is actually um, a, a herd of, of uh, red heifers there and it's considered to be a consecrated place and people are talking about maybe sacrifice them there I hope not I hope they at least come into uh, Jerusalem closer to that from that area because it is a taboo it really is because when Israel was broken up between the north and south Shiloh was that place where people actually had sacrificial offerings and um, Elohim permitted this for a while until um, Jerusalem was settled. You know, you know, King David did not conquer uh, the Canaanite city, Salem, until about you know, um, you know, 3,000 years ago from today. So it took some time. So um, this is very important because, you know, although um, you know, Elohim can be anywhere he wants to at any time, past, present, and future, but when he chooses one place, that's a very special place, right? And it's, the soil is consecrated. Uh, it's chemically changed at a quantum level. The, and when, when the divine presence comes and, t and touches uh, hearts, the earth, it, it changes it forever. And even uh, the uh, Har Har Bait that's in ruins today, many Jews still like to think that uh, Jehovah is there. I'm not sure uh, if he's there with five mosques on Temple Mount and all the idolatry throughout Israel. You have Christian uh, uh, churches, you have, you have mosques everywhere in Israel, you even have a Buddhist shrine. 
um, you know, uh, in Israel, you have all kinds of high places that are raised that are not to the holy God of Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov. So that's the state of the affairs in Israel today. Uh, the sacrifice, this, the process of sacrificing animals are also discussed. You can, um, you can uh, slaughter animals, of course, for food, um, especially those animals that are not suitable uh, for uh, Levitical uh, temple sacrifices, if they have blemishes on them, of course. But these animals must be kosher. There's, they must be kosher for human consumption. Um, with one uh, caveat, the blood has to be completely drained um, from the animal uh, after it's slaughtered. And this, this process is well known today that when you buy a black kosher beef, uh, even uh, uh, in chicken and other things like this, the blood is completely drained through a saline uh, chemical solution that's done by uh, rabbis who have uh, degrees in, in the di dietary arts, really. Um, you know, Canaanite nations had no problem drinking blood. They had no problem uh, taking a live um, uh, baby nursing goat and then uh, boiling it literally in the milk of that mother goat while it was still weaning. They had no problem taking, um, ripping apart a leg or appendage off of an animal while it was alive and eating it blood raw. This is what uh, Jehovah was warning. Do not be like those other nations. They despise me. They worship other gods. They're immoral. They're apostate. Don't even think of them. Don't say the names of their, of their polytheistic gods. Don't associate with them. Don't intermarry with them. Don't befriend them. Even though some of these people come in as traders, uh, you know, uh, selling spices and things of this nature, they have to leave, um, you know, where they come. And if they decided to stay with the uh, family of Israel, they, there are certain rules about that. Uh, they had to essentially buy, abide by uh, the misfos that were established for, for people who were born Jewish. So uh, also um, there are prohibitions about um, which foods you should eat and not eat. Again, it doesn't get into a lot of detail, but essentially a fish like an eel that does not have scales is not considered kosher. Um, you can go all the way back to uh, the flood in the time of Noah. It simply says that they were pairs of animals that were taken aboard the ark that were clean and unclean. This is what we're talking about when we say something is clean uh, for human consumption. We're essentially saying it meets minimal kosher root standards established by orthodoxy, uh, which means correct doctrine and discipline. Okay, these are debates even in Israel right now over glat kosher, about mixing um, uh, meat and dairy. Uh, I don't want to get in a lot of detail, but Karate Jews do not have a problem um, um, with not waiting six hours between having dairy and meat. And again, I mentioned this before, it, it, there's two uh, sidras or verses in the Torah that talks about this, uh, that you are not to uh, boil a kid, you know, a baby nursing goat in his mother's milk. Well, this is a pagan practice done by the Canaanites, and that's all it was, is it, it, animal abuse. It was, you know, animals are, are, are never, never to be slaughtered while they're still weaning uh, Weaving, weaning from their mother. It, it, this is abomination. And that's the, that was the primary focal point without getting into too much detail. By Moshe, it's not about waiting six hours between dairy and meat. But that has become tradition, right? It's become a tradition for what? At least 2,500 years or so? Oh, who knows? But in karate tradition, we not all of them... Um, you don't follow that rule. Well, okay, they follow literally what the Torah says and what it doesn't say. Again, um, unless you're talking about a specific use case scenario involving a, a, a mother goat and a, and a uh, baby goat that's still weaning and uh, boiling it and, and it's milk and things of this nature, then, then, then um, that's the context of what Moshe was talking about. You read the Talmud, you go into a rabbit, a rabbit's hole. That's all I'm going to say about that. So in the third Aliyah, 
is still discussing about the abominable practice of the Canaanites. Um, their women may have been beautiful. Um, their seductresses, remember what happened uh, with the, um, the, uh, the issues with the Moabites uh, and Moabite uh, women uh, that caused plagues among Israel. Remember the, the uh, valiant efforts of Pincus and all of this? Um, you know, people are susceptible, men are susceptible, uh, very weak. Some people are very weak in this. Um, even if you're married, and but you know, um, you know the human temptation of psychology is is almost um, uh, comical uh, in that if you know you can't have something, you want it even more. And listen, Moshe says, you know, this is what's going to happen. We, you know, Jehovah knows you will be tempted. You're created to be human, and to be human is to err. But, you know, here's the blueprint for success, which is, is the Torah, that you will have a, a path leading to blessings predominantly and a path that leads to curses where the reverse is true. OK, and even the Ten Commandments are some of them are positive, some of them are negative. You hear about negative uh, misfelds and positive misfelds. This is what um, Michelle was talking about. OK, um, a person professing to be a prophet uh, who claims uh their instructions are coming from Jehovah, you know, the divine creator, when, when um, Jehovah didn't even speak. And uh, even though they, um, they validate what they're saying to be true through miracles and things of that nature, um, uh, it is false, it's fake. Uh, and this person who is using essentially Jehovah's name in vain will be put to death as capital punishment. So in other, in other words, if Nostradamus lived in the time of Israel and, and was uh, prophesying and predicting the future uh, and reading tea leaves and all of this, he would be put to death. Now, Balaam was put to death eventually by the hands of, of Pincus because of the necromancy and things of this nature. So you have to be careful. Remember, the litmus test for true Navim, a true prophet of Elohim, is that there have to be 100% right 100% of the time. There's no variance there. Why? Because their words are divine and not opinionated, like rabbinical authority and the Talmud and other things like that. I'm not going to go there any further. But I'm saying prophets always speak the divine name, words of God, uh, and they don't speak for themselves. I mean, Isaiah... Uh, Isaiah actually got in trouble for that when he was being opinionated briefly and he was wanting to curse Israel and um, you know Elohim said don't curse Israel and he put uh, some tongs on his, on his, on, on his tongue uh, you know from the altar to teach him a lesson with that so we have to be very careful with that there are false prophets abound even today false messiahs the leaders astray just understand that the adversary likes to play games in our life and in the pro in ultimate prosecution of virtue, this is what Moshe was speaking about um, in this portion. So, um, you know, you hear about magician and sleight of hand and things like that. Look at the pretty woman. Don't look at what I'm doing behind my back. You know, these uh, snisters, these people uh, trying to make a quick buck are always out there. And these cultists too, unfortunately, you know, they will lead you away. They will lead you away. And, you know, Jim Jones and other cults like this, you know, people die in the process of it. Okay? So um, the section and, and the third aliyah um, prescribes a death penalty for anyone who, who attempts even the remotest perception of it. So in other words, uh, you hear, hear about um, uh, 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 crystal balls, tarot cards, and other things of this nature. Um, people, those, those shops, uh, that people open up, uh, listen, this, there were witches during this time, uh, people, uh, del delving in the dark arts. Well, I mean, don't go there. Don't be, don't have rumors of you going there. Even perception of evil, uh, can be wrong. And, and if you don't have any witnesses there, you could be blamed for these things. And it, this, this is what, uh, Ellen was saying. It could be in catastrophic if the whole city goes down that path. Okay. And uh, his, let history be our guide. That's exactly what happened in northern Israel. So the fourth aliyah, as God's children, we are forbidden to deface our bodies. And 
Here we're getting into the taboo tattoos. Um, you know, there's a lot of biker gangs and people out there, you know, the MS-13 in America, they have tattoos for initiation. Even Jew Jews have, have tattoos on their bodies. Um, making David and all those in images and things of that nature, cutting your body, uh, you know, um, it's forbidden. Uh, I mean, uh, you can do whatever you want to and each their own, but it's actually, this is where that portion comes from and Davarim that is forbidden to deface your body, okay? Some people um, have horrible scars from accidents and burns and things of that nature, and it's very dis uh, disfiguring for them, and they have to deal with that among people, and people often look at them badly because of this. But, you know, tattoos are the same thing. You're defacing, literally, the, the, the vessel in which uh, Elohim used to breathe in your neshama, your nefesh, your soul, as the image of Jehovah God. So just think about that. Polluting the image of God, taking God's name in vain, when you say you're an observant Jew, and you roll up your arm, and you see this big tattoo there. Inconsistent messaging can lead people astray too, okay? Sometimes people need justification, just a little bit, to go off of that, that cliff and to horrible, abominable acts. And best friends and everyone else lead them astray. He, if, if he can get away with it, you know, why shouldn't I, you know? It's good for them, it's good for me. Listen, this is just goy, Gentile thinking. This is not the thinking of people that are called for a better choice, a better path, uh, to be the image uh, out there, the ambassadors among all the Gentile nations uh, as true chosen children of Elohim, okay? So in the fourth Aliyah, Again, continuing, we're talking about a list of exact list of kosher animals. I mentioned this before in the synopsis. There's actually a list of certain types of animals, uh, you know, cloven hoof, hoof, and other things. You know, why uh, why a pig is not kosher? Uh, you know, um, herbivores. You know, with uh, they regurgitate their food and things of this nature. Sometimes it's kind of uh, uh, slippery slope, uh, as far as trying to make that decision, like with locusts, I don't know if you like locusts. My wife said, do not order them. They've actually been back in Israel. I wanted to try them. And the Yemenites uh, like them. I think there's about six species of them. I'm not sure, but they're problematic because we're not sure exactly which locusts that the prophets used to eat, per se. Um, but also, um, if you like caviar and you like uh, fish eggs and things, I don't. I do not eat raw fish and sashimi. And, uh, and, and I don't eat any of that, even though I lived in Japan four years. I just don't touch it. I, I believe food should be roasted and cooked and barbecued and all that stuff. Anyway, that's just me all kidding aside. But, you know, even caviar, it has to come from a fish that actually has scales. Okay? Uh, there's fish that you can catch in, a, in, a, in the country, like in uh, uh, Louisiana, in America, and catfish are not kosher, by the way, and shellfish are not kosher either. People, um, my wife and I are from Charleston, South Carolina, along the Atlantic Ocean. People love their shellfish, they love oysters and things of nature. Shrimp is not kosher, okay, it's just not. Um, also, um, again, uh, the prohibition of um, of eating any kind of animal was not properly slaughtered. What that's saying is, you know, Torah does not tell us exactly what type of knife to use to slaughter an animal, but it speaks enough about um, uh, preventing pain, undue pain and suffering to an animal, like like an ox that's muzzled, an ox that that is not that is prevented to be tempted from the um, the um, the cart that's pulling full of hay grass, grain, and things of that nature that's pulling that load. Um, also, I told you about um, uh, how ethically way to, to treat animals. Some people, uh, observer Jews, don't have animals in their house because if you do, that animal has to eat and drink before you do. And some people are not that humble and not that um, unselfish, believe it or not. All kidding aside. Um, so there is a proper way to slaughter um, um, an animal. Uh, we don't have a temple anymore, unfortunately, to, for that kosher root level to sacrifice animals. But all animals that are considered kosher, namely cattle and things of this nature, are, are, are instantly killed 
Uh, there's they don't use uh, lead electricity and other things like this. Some in some countries they actually um, use um, use hammers and things like that to hit to hit in the back of the head. We don't do that. Uh, we have a standard with that. We have a very sharp um, uh, slaughtering knife, butcher knife, or whatever that considered to be approved by rabbis to do the process without me getting into a lot of detail here. You, have, you go to yeshiva, you go to school to learn about this practice, and it's, it's done by rabbis, essentially, that they are licensed to do this. And um, it very, it very, there's a lot in the Torah about ethically, the ethical way to treat animals, to, to do everything you can in your power, not to cause them undue pain and suffering, okay? Even, um, even a mother bird, uh, you're hungry, right? And you want those eggs, right? You like you want scrambled eggs? Well, uh, you're not allowed to to uh, to shoo away that bird or scare away that bird. You have to wait until that bird voluntarily leaves that nest to retrieve those eggs. And there's a lot of stories about that. They're equally sweet. Uh, just a moment here and flip it through my notes. And um, wrapping this up in a fifth aliyah. Again, in the book of Davarim, uh, chapter 11, going through chapter 16. Okay, in the fifth aliyah, we talk about giving uh, a tenth of one's crops to the Levite. We actually do this today. Um, in synagogues, we give one-tenth, approximately one-tenth. Today, uh, everyone gives um, a certain percentage that may be different. Uh, there's a, there you donate to, to the show, a tax deductible and things of that nature. But that whole tradition today that we have in practice uh, comes from Davarim. It comes from that, that you are to give a tenth of your crops, your produce, your total profit first goes over to the Levites because they're not allowed to own real estate, they're not allowed to grow vegetables, and, and they're not allowed to own land, okay? Essentially, and, and it's to, to support the priesthood. It's to support the priesthood. Uh, rabbis don't, do not make a lot of money, even though Christian pastors make millions. But anyway, uh, it's not about, you don't go in that profession to be wealthy, okay? So um, there's also uh, a second type. It's fascinating to see here how gracious God is because you think about Eretz Israel. Not a huge country, but people, when you're walking, you don't have back then before you had cars and planes and, and trains and things of that nature. It took a long time to walk from northern Israel down to Jerusalem or, or from very far south in the Gap Desert uh, in the east and west. Well, there was an opportunity for these people traveling, you know, um, to offer their tithe at a, of another point in time, okay? But the majority of people were to bring their crops or produce, 10% of that in baskets and things of that nature at a certain time of the year, okay? Um, also, uh, it was brought, of course, Jerusalem and brought before the temple. Uh, provision is made for the people um, that are far away, uh, but they're encouraged to plan accordingly, okay? And uh, this is actually done in Israel today. Uh, um, you're talking about uh, your jubilee and things of that nature where you let crops rest, uh, where you uh, allow homeless to, uh, to gleam the fields, what's ever left over after the machinery goes through and everything else. This is actually in practice today in Israel. And these farmers uh, take a huge hit in their profit. But, you know, they have faith. They have faith in Jehovah will provide. And it's a wonderful thing, even in the 21st century. I like to hear those stories. And uh, when you hear about those businesses doing that, when it comes to that, that seven-year time mark, please donate to them, okay? Um, there's a three-year tithing cycle. After the conclusion of each cycle, we have a commanded to purge our homes over due tithes. Uh, because they're not suitable to offer things, you know, you know, reach their point of serviceable operation, they expire, right? Um, and uh, they need to be quickly and expeditiously given to the intended people. Maybe people had a favorite priest or representative of their tribe, and Yaman may have, have certain priests that they actually give ties to versus other tribes. I'm not sure the detail is not in there. Um, the sixth Aliyah, Moshe commands the Israelites to designate every seventh year as a Shemitah. This is a sabbatical year. Uh, and when the Jews uh, forgot about this, uh, especially in Judea, uh, this is actually what contributed to the fall of Jerusalem during that time at the, uh, at the uh, swordsman of the Babylonian, you know, essentially. 
This is one of the huge violations, not returning land to the poor where it was taken, um, uh, not returning um, uh, indentured servants back to freedom and not letting them loose. Uh, things, these promises and vows and everything were not always kept. But it was a huge thing, uh, a bone of contention with Jehovah. It's something he absolutely hated about people breaking their promises and hurting the widows, the orphans, those people less fortunate than yourself, okay? And all these, all these uh, contributions, everything, returning land, um, you know, releasing your servants at a certain point in time should be done in, in a happy heart, not out of reluctance. Unfortunately, in the time of Judea, before its fall, people did things through reluctance and resistance. They really did. Okay? So, um, again, a Jewish slave must have be freed after six years of service and given a generous severance gift as it departs. Well, they have to have something. And just think about, you know, welfare today, you know, the New Deal and Roosevelt and all of this. Well, there was no social welfare in Israel during the time of Moshe, a letter of Joseph and King David and King Solomon. Um, people took care of each other, um, we, uh, just like one extended family. They, they take care of each other. There's kibbutz in Israel where everyone uh, picks up, you know, uh, picks up something and does something. They work together. Uh, um, there, no one is short. Uh, on anything, everyone wins or loses together, and that's the way it should be, right? So in a seventh aliyah, the male firstborn of kosher cattle must be consecrated and given to the Kohen to eat, okay? Um, fascinating uh, ritual here, a uh, commandment uh, by Elohim, absolutely, that the firstborn of everything you have, even the very best of your crops and everything else, uh, you know, sometimes a fruit tree needs to grow several years before you can even eat of it. You know, like a fig tree in my backyard, if I was in the land of Israel, I would have to wait um, seven years, I believe, uh, before I could even have any of the figs. Uh, what this is a requirement there is that things belong to Elohim first and then to us second. Of course, the Levites needed their 10% of that as well. Also, the animals were considered extra consecrated and sacred before God. Um, just like the firstborn of men and children, you hear about the firstborn of Egypt, uh, they were equivocated to Levitical priests. Uh, they were considered holy. And uh, even uh, Jewish couples who have uh, a boy first, um, they give that boy over to, to, um, to religious service and God, you know, to become a rabbi, uh, to be under the tutorage of another rabbi, that kind of thing. Uh, these traditions, um, Nazarite traditions, are very um, still still ongoing and very healthy, um, especially among Hasidic uh, sects and uh, ultra orthodox and uh, observant Jews. Also, Karate Jews consider this sacred as well. Um, wrapping this up, uh, the tour this tour reading concludes with the discussion regarding the three festivals. Uh, Pesach, Shavuot, Sukkot, the, the High Holidays. In addition, some of the laws regarding of each festival individually. Of course, we have um, High Holidays. We have major and minor holidays. We also have contemporary holidays, like, uh, like the uh, celebrating the independence of Israel and, uh, and, and uh, the, when we won over Jerusalem in 1967. Uh, also, so... Um, uh, Karite, Karite Jews focus mainly on the holidays that are mentioned in the Torah and the Tanakh and discussed through the various expositions of the Navim, the prophets, more than anything else. The Sok is done a little bit different among Karite families than Rabbinites, uh, in that uh, counting Omer is done a little bit differently as well. I mean, you need to have Omer, uh, you need to have something right to be able to start counting, and they take it very verbatim, very seriously. Of course, this is from the point of view uh, that you're living in Israel in the first place, okay? Um, also, that you need to be in Israel to actually properly celebrate these holidays. Um, when the, after the second Pesach uh, in the wilderness, the Jewish people there, they would not celebrate Pesach again until they were in the land of Israel. Of course, you know, we, we compromise, and we have 50 shades of gray, and we have... We have Pesach every year in the, 
the uh, month of Nisan and, um, you know, in the diaspora. And we hope that, uh, you know, Eliyahu will come knocking at our door. You know, we really do hope it's the last time we have to have Passover in the exile, you know, in other countries over the Neretz Israel. Well, that's about it. Uh, this is Parashat Ria. I gave you an Aliyah summary. I hope I was brief and to the point. Um, I just want to say, how is this contextually relevant today? It very much is. I mean, <clears throat> you have, when you grow up and you're educated, um, you're educated, uh, first of all, by, if, you ha if you're raised by good parents, they teach you through example, okay? They, hopefully, they're not hypocritical because children are all about what's fair, right? And then you grow up and you, um, you get a job, and you go through life experiences and marriage and things of this nature. You have children of your own and you go to college and university and you get educated. Well, you know, the world has one way of educating and then God has another, essentially. And hopefully you can have a hybrid approach where you can weigh both together and know that, that um, to be human is to be imperfect and to sin. It really is. And, you know, um, Elohim does not want anyone to fail. He really does it. He had no pleasure in, peop in people's uh, souls remaining in, in uh, um, Gehonim, uh, instead of Shoal. He has no pleasure in the destruction of people. Uh, you can read Ethical, chapter 18. I like to read verse 20 through 23, and that it speaks it very well. That, you know, Elohim has a salvation plan for you, a redemption plan, whether you're a Jew or Gentile. He, you know, he loves us all, and we're all precious in his sight. We really are. You know, the Jewish people are chosen. It uh, doesn't mean we're self-righteous and better than anyone else. It just means that we have a greater burden and a, and a greater responsibility for holding face before Elohim, not to take his name in vain before people who are watching us who are not Jewish on what way they should uh, proceed in life, Okay. I essentially, I, I'm wearing my clothes that I wore to work today. Everyone knows I'm orthodox in my practices. They know that I am a tribal ethnic Jew. That's why I wear this uh, in honor of my ancestry, my father's side in Morocco. You know, and people expect a certain measure of quality in your work too when you look like this. And not saying I'm a handsome Joe. My wife thinks I'm the most handsome guy around. But anyway... Getting close to the anniversary, we try to be nice to one another. What I'm saying is, is that when people see a sador on your desk in office, they 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 um, have uh, an expectation or an assumption they've already made. I don't like Jewish people, for instance. They may say that, or they may say, "I don't know too much about what Jews believe." You know, I don't know. But I, I see this person here. He seems to be Jewish. He seems to wear a yarmulke. Uh, most Jews in America don't even wear a yarmulke. They don't, they don't have peyo. They don't have tzitzit on uh, all day long like I do. But what to each their own. The thing is that, that for me to look like this and not hide my Jewishness within me, that means I have to work harder than everyone else, right? And it's not that I have something to prove to anyone else because when I am advertising Elohim, I am advertising God in my life with my smile and being nice and gracious to other people. It does not cost anything to be nice to people. And I, I have all these encounters in the elevator. So what I'm saying is, you know, life is full of choices, both positive and negative. I mean, uh, hopefully you don't have to burn your hand several times before you really understand I should not do that anymore. You know, maybe uh, men should listen to their wives more. Um, maybe wives should listen to their husbands. And our children should definitely listen to both of us if we're not hypocritical. But, you know, I hope your choices would be a blessing. I really do. I hope that you, your life is filled with prosperity. If you're sick and hurting, we're full of shlema to you. We should bark for people that have loved ones in, in the hospital or hospice. My mother-in-law, essentially, in a, in a closed ward in a hospice situation. I think of her all the time. I think of my mother, who's who's having a yard site coming up. And I know people have, have mourning uh, you know, in their life, whether you're Jew or Gentile, it still hurts, right? When you lose someone you love. But you know, pick up the phone, you know, uh, write a letter, uh, let people know you care about them, you're thinking about them, wish them happy birthday. 
Y'all put a let some back, you know, to people. And that's why social media is great for it, for that. Well, that's all I got to say. Tuning out, Rev. You are a benemit. Be blessed. Be well. You know, share the knowledge of love and wealth and truth to everyone who's willing to hear it. If they're resistant, why don't you try living that truth and you see them running to you? Like Zechariah 8.23, when 10 people from different tribes of different belief system, non-Jews, rush and grab the hem of the garment of a Jew and say, take me to Jerusalem, take me to the temple, teach me about your Torah. We were wrong. Your God is right. Not that you were right, but your God you're advertising is right. And it's a wonderful thing. Okay? Shalom Aleichem. Listen, subscribe, person notify, share uh, this video with everyone that you know. Uh, I want to improve on how I present myself. Um, you know, I want to bless you. Uh, it doesn't matter who you are. I care about you. Listen, I could read um, this parish out myself. I have a lot of sacred books in my home. I have a lot of taxes and support uh, materials, and I could learn and become wise in that, but or I could also share it to other people that may not have those resources and are still very immature in their life's journey. Take care. Shalom. Goodbye.